I enjoy coming to work, but I only come to work for a reason, and that reason is to, to make money. Carl Hartley exposes his own industry and the crashing car market. He slams electric cars. The last thing that appeals to me is an electric car. There's no soul because it's quiet. You can't judge the, the drive or the speed. I like to hear revs. He opens up about the best and worst car deals he's ever done. What's the weirdest thing you've been offered to take as a pie exchange for a car? Someone's girlfriend. <laughs> and he shares stories never told and secrets never shared. I've answered the phone. Good evening, Carl speaking, can I help? The minute he opened his voice, I knew he was nine years old. The last two times I went to see Carl, I bought an Audi RS Q8 and a 1989 Porsche 911 Turbo. Watch to the end to see if Carl Hartley can sell me a third car in a row. Carl, is the car market crashing? Uh, no, the car market isn't crashing, the car market is exactly where we left it before we went on this crazy ride through COVID and, uh, and um, cars not being available and um, factories closing down due to COVID and then factories closing down due to a, a war. And then the, the, the company makes the chips for the cars being in, in, in that country where the war is going on. So the supply was like, you know, one out of 10 instead of 10 out of 10. Mm. So the car market is exactly where we left it in 2019. So do you think what happened in the last three or four years of buying a car that would normally drop 30 or 40% but went up 10%, do you think that'll never happen again? Because even you said before, people were making money on Range Rovers. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people are beginning to talk themselves into, we're in a bad marketplace. You know, the, over the last three years, I haven't lost any money in a car. I've actually earned money out of cars. Every car I've had for the last three years, I've earned money in. And now I'm losing money. The market must be on its ass. No, it's just we went through an un, you know, un, un, you know, an area where it was unseen before. We've never been there before, you know? And um, now we're just, it's normal. Yeah. It's normal. Just and what you will see, mark my words, what you will see is since COVID, there's been a few sort of everyone's become a supercar dealer. Everyone's become a watch dealer, you know? Oh, you can't lose. Well, it's easy to make money in a business where you can't lose, but now you can lose. And these guys that are here today, they're gonna to be gone tomorrow. Well, people who came in at the peak, bought a load of watches and cars, and now their stock's gone through the floor. Yeah, and they don't know how to deal with it because they've got no experience, because yeah. this, is not, this is not what they was born for yeah you know they they haven't they haven't been seen through it before so these these people these me dad calls them johnny come late these <laughs> these, jo <laughs> these johnny come late these let's see let's see how they cope yeah times like this separate the men from the boys wasn't there something recently happened with lord elaine what happened didn't he get 1.7 million of cars seized oh i heard yeah. i heard um well i never heard i seen in one of the one of the um, tabloids on online that uh, there were some cars seen. but you know with that business you, you 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 don't know you don't know what goes on in the sense of it, it you know it could be someone who they hired a car to you know they might mm. have hired those cars something might have happened in one of those cars you don't know yeah i I've, i don't know and what about this why why else would they have cars seized yeah well, normally when you get cars seized, it's because you're behind on the payments. Isn't, it? isn't that normally the reason? Oh, well, why? or you're a human trafficker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Allegedly, one of the two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, touche. And what about this, like, sale or return business model? I know GVE do that, don't they? Um, is that a sustainable model? Um, it's a sustainable model when it's your only model. Um, if you don't have the funds to buy your stock, then how else are you going to get people to give you their cars? Mm. Um, you just heard, I had a conversation there before we started filming with, with a guy I tried to buy a car from. Yeah. And, um, you know, his thoughts on, because I told him if he doesn't take my offer, he's going to end up giving the car to somebody on a sale of return because they're going to offer him more on a sale of return. That's not going to be achievable. And then in three months, he's going to call me and take less than what we've just talked about. And his response was, I know I don't do sale or return. And that's why. Why? Well, let's just say, um, 
let's just say you want to sell your Aventador Roadster and you come to me and say, Carl, what it's, what's it worth? And I say, it's worth, it's worth 200,000. And you say, but Carl, you know, they're for sale for 230. I want 220. But Rob, it's not worth 220. Well, so-and-so down the road told me if I give them my car, they will get me 220. Okay, well, I also said that I can dunk a basketball at five foot six, but I can't, you know? So then you give them the car, you sign a contract, month, two months, three months sometimes, they have control of your car, the market falls. In three months time, your car's now worth 180. They haven't got you the 220. And guess who you're selling it to? Me. So, sale of return can work, can work well on some cars. If you're very transparent with, with, with the owner and say, look, you want 220 for your car, I want to give you 200. I actually have somebody, if you give me five or six days with the car, I have somebody, let me offer it to them and let me try and sell it for you to get you the 210 and me, I'll sneak a few quid out of it and everyone's happy. That's a good, that's a good concept, that's good business. Mm. Um, but a lot of people just give these pie in the sky sailor return offers to get control of the customer's car and then, you know, buy it for a lot lower price when they're two months down the line and, oh, the market's dropped. I mean, anyone who's watching this podcast who's had these cars will, will completely appreciate and understand and probably experienced what I'm about to say. You know, the market's dropped. It's not what it was. The guy doesn't like the interior. But I, I've got another offer for the car and I can, I can return you back 190. What happened to the 210 you were going to return me back a minute ago? Well, yeah, well, that's not, not going to happen. But they've got control of your mm. car. They have possession of your car. It's nine tenths of the law of possession. They've got possession of your car. They've got control of your car. So what do you end up doing? You end up letting them have it for 190. I offered you 200 a week ago to buy it. So um, it's, it can be, a, but these people, they're going to come and go. They're, you know, they, 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 won't, they won't be here very soon. Mm. You buy all your stock then? I buy 90, 95% of my yeah. stock, yeah. And, and what condition would you take a sale or return? In like a, a situation I've just said, yeah. you, um, you've, you offer me a car, we can't come to agreement on the price, which is got, it's gonna be hard. One of us is not realistic if that's the case. Mm. And, but I might have somebody that inquired on the last one that I had and he missed it because I sold it to somebody else. Mm. So if I go back to Mr. Jones and say, remember the black Aventador Roadster we had that you missed? Yeah, well, I've got a gray one now. How, how do you like the gray one? Well, I'd love to see it, Carl. Okay, Rob, can I have your car for a couple of days? That's, that's the way to do business. Mm. And have you not seen a big drop in a lot of your stock? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I've seen a big drop in, um, in a lot of uh, older stock that we had that carried over from COVID times. Um, yeah, big drop. And how do you handle that, survive with that as a business? Well, um, it's not ideal, but it, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like going to a casino. Um, if you go for the blackjack table and you're 10,000 pounds up, you never leave when you're 10,000 pounds up. You might leave with seven, you never leave with 10. So you have to give some back. You know, at the time we were buying pretty much every car that come across our desk because times were so good. We were just buying, buying, buying. And sometimes you got stuck with a few things and that's just the way it is. Mm. And my clients have experienced a big drop in value in their cars. So I have. And it's an easier conversation when someone says, but Carl, I've lost, I've lost 50,000 in this car in a year. Well, that's good because I've just lost 100 in that one mm. and I haven't opened the door of it yet. So, you know, it's just the way it goes. Mm. But then I suppose, surely 2019, 20, 21, 22, you must have just wanted maximum stock because everything was going up. Exactly. So you have to, you have to, you have to ride the wave. Mm. You have to take that chance, take that risk. And, um, you know, we got stuck with a few things, but who didn't? Mm. What do you reckon is the average amount of time it takes you to sell a car? It depends on the car. So um, the average? Oh, there's no average. There's, there's really always no, an average. There's not really, because... It's the slowest and the fastest and all of them in between divided by the number of cars. Okay, so <laughs> I, I would allow three weeks to sell a car. If a car isn't sold in three weeks, it's the wrong color or the wrong price. And if it's the wrong color, the price needs to be better. Yeah. So that's what I normally allow. But 
You'd be amazed how many cars I sell in a day, in an hour, in two hours from literally buying it. Wow. It, I mean, it's I sell a lot. So many cars don't make our website. Mm. And that's, um, do you, when you buy a car, normally have someone in mind to sell it? Well, the minute you buy a car and you part with your money and it's currently now in stock, your brain has to switch on and you have to think, right, what's the plan here? <laughs> you know, who can I sell this to? Yeah. And you have to, you, ha you have to think, you have to work, you have to, you have to wonder where it, um, where it's going. Mm. And you make a few phone calls and one of them phone calls could be the guy for the car. Mm. So that's, that's why. It, when I take a car in stock, and it's advertised on the web and it's in the showroom and it's in stock. That's because my ideas for that car <laughs> haven't worked <Yeah>. yet. <laughs> you know, so I need to look for somebody different. So that's the last effort at selling it. Exactly, then, yeah. exactly. I can, I can, we sell so many cars that we don't advertise and people don't even know about, mm. you know. Mm. Through different avenues, someone might express to me, Carl, I really want a Ferrari per sangue. When you get one, will you let me know? I really want one. So the minute you buy a Pro Sangue, bang, he's your first call. Yeah. And these people, they don't talk nonsense. They, you know, they know what they've got to give for a car. I've known them for a long time. They're not going to tell me they want a Pro Sangue. And then when I say, you've got a car, it's going to oh, well, no, I don't want it now. Yeah. You know, so that's how it works. Mm. What do you think the future of the supercar market is? I think there's always a future in a supercar market because people will always love supercars. I think people... I think electric cars, have, full electric cars, have been exposed to people as not being in demand. Um, I never thought they ever were in demand. Why but, not? Well, because being a petrol head and being somebody who's grown up uh, with cars and loves cars, I love cars. Um, the last thing that appeals to me is an electric car. I think it's... Why? Well, there's no soul. There's no. There's no. Because it's quiet. Because it's, it's it's got no noise. Yeah. And it you don't you you can't you can't judge the 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 drive or the speed. I like to hear revs when I when I drive a car. You know you don't. I don't have to look at the speedo to know what gear I'm in mm. when I'm driving a car because I can tell by the noise of the revs. In an electric car, it's just like you don't know. It, I think they're dangerous. You don't know how fast you're going because you've got no sense of noise, um, and. Yeah, they they all become a bit. They didn't. They didn't. I don't think they look very good. Um, I get hybrid cars. I think they're a good thing, because the way like Ferrari do their hybrids, they, they actually give more power to the engine than just oh let's run it off of a battery. But full electric cars, people I think were conned to thinking in twenty thirty we've got to have an electric car. We're not allowed to drive a car with petrol in it. Well, obviously you were, but not a new one. Mm. So everyone went, oh, electric, electric, electric. And now they've seen we're six years away from this law that's going to be out. We've got nowhere near the infrastructure and won't for a very long time. So people are like, oh, um, I don't need to buy an electric car anymore. Mm. I suffered that for two years. I'm going to buy a supercar, you know? Yeah. Do you think electric cars have a future as a supercar? Eventually... They will, because eventually we will have to have them, but I don't think for a very, very long time. I think by the time electric cars come out, we could be talking about flying cars. You started that P1, mm -hmm. and I've got a lot of nice cars, but you starting that P1 was an exciting experience. Mm -hmm. You are never going to get that experience in an electric car, no. starting a car that you've never heard before. Like, I know driving really nice cars is great, but if you're someone who can't drive them because you don't have them, or, you know, I've got seven cars, as you know, most of them are bought a few, <laughs> but I haven't got a P1. Yeah. But watching you start that, the sixth time, <laughs> was really exciting. Mm. You're just never going to get that in an electric car ever, are you? No, I, um, I've said this before, and people might like it, people might not like it. You are not a car enthusiast. You don't like cars if you drive an electric car. You don't like cars? No, you like Elon Musk. That's why they buy Tesla. You, you, you're, you're business minded. You know how you can run it through your business. You know how you can make it cost effective. But unfortunately, they've, they've lost so much money electric cars that you can't make it cost effective now. Yeah. Um, but you don't like cars. No one lusts after a Porsche Taycan. <laughs> you know, they don't go, oh, you know what? I've got the horn for. <laughs>
yeah. a take and cross turismo. <laughs> no, no one has ever done that. No, no, it's because they're shit. That's why. Yeah. Electric cars, they do a, they do a job. They serve a purpose. Run it through your business, claim it back, rather than pay tax, buy something to enjoy yourself with. But you're not going to really enjoy yourself in it, if I'm honest. No. Boring as hell. Yeah. What's financially the most you've ever made in a car? Um, well, percentage-wise. Amount-wise. Yeah, well, amount-wise, you know, uh, two million. You've made, you have made two million selling a car. Yeah. Wow. What but car per Percentage-wise, it was just the normal percentage. Right. You know, it was just a very expensive car, which I can't disclose, but it was a very expensive Boring. car. I know. Boring. We've come all this way. <laughs> Contracts and all that, non-disclosures and all that. But yeah. yeah. Okay. So as a, a very old, very expensive Ferrari. Right. Just leave it as that. Okay. I won't push you anymore. You might not let me, but yeah. let me back. <laughs> okay. As a percentage, what's the best margin you made in a car? Oh, 200%. Wow. Yeah, but that could be a car that's 30 grand. Yeah. You know, that was a bit of a risk and we bought and no one knows what it's worth and we just sold it for a lot of money. You know, recently I've just made 100% on a car. And, you know, in, in 2024, to make 100% in a car that you haven't had for a long time, bearing in mind this is something I had for one day. Wow. And I made 100% profit in one day. In 2024, when people got access to internets and prices and everything, mm. you know, that's, 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 quite, that's quite hard to do. Yeah. But for instance, I made 100% in my Pagani. Yes. And how, but you had but I had it for three years. Yeah, yeah. That's still a great return. Great return. Great return. What did you sell that for? 2.6. Right. Do you miss the Pagani? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you think you would miss it when you sold it? Yeah. And what's better than it that you could replace it with? Uh, I replaced it um, with the happiness of my wife and kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I replaced it with. Uh, we, we wanted to move, uh, move houses. Um, my wife um, was, she, she'd done her time living up at the business and um, now we're bringing up kids and the business has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And obviously I lived on site. So I've got customers, I've got staff, I've got, deliveries, collections every day, all day coming in. So she was reluctant not let, to let the kids really go far outside or anything like that because there's always a worry the gate's open. Yeah. You know, who's coming in the gate? Who's coming out the gate? So, you know, we decided that we'll, we'll try and find somewhere, somewhere new, um, you know, locally. And we moved a bit further away than what I would have ideally liked to. But what we were looking for doesn't exist around here. Mm. Um, but what we've got now is uh, is making everybody very happy, mm. and uh, I'll be back in the um, I'll be back in the hypercar ownership very very soon. It's not like I don't have a car, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I have a few, so um, you know it's nice to switch it up. Mm. Mark Sheldon Lloyd is the proud owner of this episode as he invested in one of my first series, Disruptors NFTs. He's one of only 42 people on this planet that owns one of the NFTs and one of my episodes for life. And as a doctor, he always wanted to own supercars. Mark is now a multiple supercar owner and he was able to buy them through the profits from his property investing. Mark now offers mentoring and coaching to other doctors and people in the healthcare profession wanting to grow their business. His name is Mark Sheldon Lloyd. You can find him on the Mark Sheldon Lloyd podcast or you can find him on LinkedIn. As one of my clients for many years, I can vouch for Mark for being not only very successful and wealthy, but also a thoroughly decent chap. Does selling it make you hungry to want to go and get another one? Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You can be. It's good to sell things every now and again, or empty your bank well, look, account I, every yeah, now and again. Yeah, I, 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 for I, I would. I said to to people, to friends, even to probably you, I said, you know, I'm never going to sell a Pagani. I'm never going to sell it because I was happy with it then. Yeah. You know, I didn't have a reason why I would. So why would I sell it? It obviously, I'd, I'd done very well financial. I was doing very well financially in it. It's a very rare car. I couldn't replace it. Loved it. Why, why would I sell it? Why would you sell this car? Well, then when a reason comes up why you should sell the car, um, you look at things differently, don't you? Mm. And you think, okay, well, 
I've got to take X, Y, Z amount out my business, which is going to cost me X, Y, Z to do, yeah. or I've got a 2.7 million pounds sitting in the corner of the showroom that I've not used for three months. Yeah, because your point about taking out of the business, you might have to take double out to pay all the tax to net Correct. what you're left. Correct. Yeah. And obviously the house that we ended up buying was a higher price than what we initially um, sort of started looking at. But that's that's my Standard, wife. Yeah. That's my wife yeah. all over. It's like three hundred percent more than what we were looking at. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's you know I had a reason. But you know, just move on. Just yeah. start, you do it again. It's no yeah. big deal. So what might you replace the Bagani with then? There's got to be something above that. Yeah, well, you know, I I went from the last the last three uh, sort of special cars that I had. I went from my favorite car in the whole world um, and my dream car, which was a Lamborghini Countach, which was a piece of rubbish, by the way. <laughs> so, so if you do buy one of those, um, just look at it. <laughs> just don't try and drive it. Just look at it. And it's lovely. It's beautiful. Mm. And it make me, made me feel incredible owning my dream car. Yeah. Not many people can say they've owned their dream car. That mm. was my dream car as a kid. <clears throat> From then, from that, I went to a Bugatti Veyron, which I pretty much used daily and uh, loved that car. Uh, I had that for four years. And then I went from that to a Pagani Waira. So, you know, you tell me, what's, where do I go? Well, I'm asking you. Where, where, where do I go? I don't, I don't know where to go. I've always had a thing. Um, for, I, like, I love gold wing doors. Like the Bugatti had the gold wing mm. doors. And the, the first car that done that was a Mercedes 300 SL, mm. a 1955, 56, 300 SL, um, which is not normally my type of thing, but they are a beautiful thing. Mm. And I think for the amount I use a really special car, I, I could get away with having one of those, because it's not something you're going to use all the time. You can't use it all the time. Yeah. Um, but I quite, I quite fancy something like that. Not that in particular, but you know, a black one of them would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they look great. But you know, I could change like I could change like the wind. I could, I could buy a, I don't know, a LaFerrari instead. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Mm. It depends what I, I look at things a bit differently. I, I want to buy a car that I love, but I also want to buy a car that I feel is a good financial investment. Mm. So, somewhere in between that, there's a line. Yeah. And I need to get to that line. Mm. Would I buy a car that's a great financial investment, but I don't love? No. I'd buy it for the business, obviously. Yeah. But I'm not going to buy it personally and keep it because I'm going to look at the thing. Mm. And I've always tell my collectors this when I, when I do business with them. Don't buy a car that you don't love because the minute you see a return, any kind of return, you'll sell it. Because you'll think, I don't like that car. It's done well. It's given me a 5% return. I'm going to sell it. If you love that car, you'll see a 50% return. You might see a 100% return because you're reluctant to sell. Oh, the car's gone up in value, but I love it. Mm. It's gone up again, but I love it. Mm. But it's gone up now 100%. Hmm, not sure how much I love it. <laughs> 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 you know? So that's why I always tell them, buy it for, first and foremost, buy a car you love. Yeah. And then buy it for the right price. Have the, um, have the F40s dropped yet? Or are they just oh, they're a ro they're a roller coaster at the minute an F forty they um they they not so long ago were a million pounds yeah they then went to two million pounds literally in three months yeah ridiculous some even more and they've now come down to mid ones uh -huh. so one and a, between one and a half and one point seven so they've come down yeah everything has come down uh, you know in the last year from what it was three years previous yeah. F40 long term, do you think that's a good one? Because that's my, that and the Testarossa were my two dream cars. I yeah, well, they're poster also. cars, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, that was my yeah. age. Why, like we just said, do kids these days have Teslas and, and, no. and, and take hands as poster cars? <laughs> no. They don't, do they? They don't have posters. No, they don't have posters, <laughs> though. But, you know, what, what, what do you love about an F40? Probably when I got into cars, that was, it was the Testarossa the Countach and the F40 that were on all the posters, they, yeah. were, the, they were the cars, yeah, yeah, weren't yeah. they, that every boy loved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you said, the nostalgia. I remember when I bought the Testarossa. I mean, it did. it's only a 120 odd grand car when, when I bought it, but I was buying everything I'd ever worked for in my life. I was buying through that car. I have seven mm -hmm. cars. It's probably like my fifth best. 
but j just to look at it and have it. Mm -hmm. So for me, the next one is the F40. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I want to try and buy it quite well. <laughs> there's uh, there's not many cars that I'm scared of, um, but I'm 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 mentally scared of an F40. Just because it's a, it's a shell and a steering wheel. They are ruthless, ruthless. They um so they're a they're a twin turbo car. Mm. Uh, the V8 twin turbo, uh, rear wheel drive, no traction, nothing, no driver aids at all. Yeah. Um, but the turbos, they you can't predict them, you know. Yeah. When you drive a turbo powered car, you hear it, and you know when the power is going to come. Oh, you have no idea with an F40. <laughs> you have no. They're so inconsistent. Right. You could be hammering the car in third gear, and. You're nowhere near that. You're, you're on 4,000 revs and the turbo is not coming in. Mm. Or you could change down, go around a corner at 2,000 revs. The turbo could kick in and you're facing the wrong way. Like they, they're, they're insane. They're, I've had a few close calls in there. 14. Oh, yeah. 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 But yeah, what, what car? Yeah. What will they do? They're an iconic car. Are they the best looking car that's ever been made? Uh, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Of course. But I mean, I think an F50 is a, a better car. A lot of people hate the F50. Better to look at or better, better to look at, better to drive, better to own. Well, of course, it's going to be better to um, drive because it's a newer car. Not much newer. You know, an F40 come out in 88 and an F50 come out in 94. So well, why you know, there's only six years. Well, uh, an F40 is not that rare of a car. All right. So there were 1,400 okay. odd yeah. F40s made, albeit... Most of them are probably laid in a hedge somewhere. <laughs> um, and F50s, there were 349. And how much is an F50 nowadays? Three and a half million. Right. So, but so for a long time, an F40 was more than an F50. Yeah. For a long time. Does that reflect people like the look of the F40? Yeah, better? people don't like the look of the F50. Yeah. What, what I see in an F50 is um, it's convertible and it's coupe as well. It's got a hard top removable top. Mm. So for instance, a LaFerrari is a coupe. A LaFerrari Aperta is a convertible. A LaFerrari is uh, three million pounds. A LaFerrari Aperta is nearly five. But you get that in one car with the F50. Mm. There's 349 of them compared to 1400 F40s. Yeah. Compared to 399 Enzos and compared to um, 499 LaFerraris with another 200 Roadsters. So nearly 700 cars there. Um, F50s are really, really, really rare. And it, you know, you can't call it a sleeper because it's not a sleeper anymore because they've just skyrocketed. But for a long time, it was a sleeper. Mm. It wasn't long ago, we were buying them for half a million pounds. Wow. Really wasn't long ago. 10 years. Yeah. 10 years, they're half a million pounds. They've nearly, you know, they've, they've God, they've, they've got up 500% more, yeah. 600%. Yeah, wow. What's the most cars you've taken in as a trade for a car? Oh, I've had some <laughs> funny deals. Uh, not so long ago, I took in four cars and eight watches. <laughs> <laughs> but not, not, not you know, Richard Mills, Patek. Yeah. Um, yeah. Four cars and eight watches. Four cars and for eight watches. For one car. For one car. What was the car? A LaFerrari. Four cars and eight watches. Yeah, four cars and eight watches. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Got rid of all eight watches in two days. Yeah. Do you still take watches in yeah. for cars? Take watches, boats, helicopters, Do you? land. What have you got? <laughs> <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've been offered to take as a pie exchange for a car? Someone's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so you've taken boats as well. Did you take the girlfriend? Of course I took the girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've uh, yeah, I've taken boats, helicopters, um, all all sorts. Wow, all sorts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're a one stop shop. Yeah, you know, we we yes, we are a supercar, classic car, hypercar dealer. That's what we are predominantly. But we're a lifestyle. So, the kind of people we sell our supercars to. We also sell our classic cars too. We also, they're watch collectors. They also have a helicopter. They also have a boat. So why, why am I gonna send 
um, one of my customers to Sunseeker to buy a boat with Ingo Bung Bung from me. Mm. Does that mean you've got to be really on the button on what the values of, of all these assets yeah, are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't, you can't, because these things, obviously a boat is, there's not really more of a depreciation asset than a boat or a helicopter, really. Mm. Um, so you have to, you still have to keep your, 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 your finger on the pulse with those. Yeah. But we never go that long without trading in those, um, trading in those things. So, you so know, if I went three years or two years without trading in a boat or a helicopter, then I would be off the boil a bit, wouldn't I? Yeah. But because we're doing it month in, month out, it's not a big deal. So you'll get a helicopter or a boat or a watch in and, and what you're, you'll have someone to sell that to just like you do the cars. Because I've already got the client base. There's yeah. not a different client base for both. So, no, it's just the same client base. It's the same client base. Just selling them different products. Yeah. 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 Do you ever, you, you own the helicopter, do you? We used you to. Have? Yeah. Used to. Uh, but my dad wouldn't, um, he wouldn't get in it. No? No, no. Why so, not? Because he, uh, we thought it was a good idea at the time, and it was, I used to use it quite a lot, um, but he, uh, he wouldn't use it. Then I felt bad using it all the time and him not getting any use out of it. And then we we, uh, we we rented it out when we weren't using it. And then running costs, the, the, you know, the rent of the helicopter sort of paid for the running costs, but it was still a lot of money tied up in something that we weren't using that much. So um, Couldn't you depreciate it though? Couldn't you run it through the business? We did, yeah. but they, I mean, they lose a lot of money. Yeah. And he was like, if we're buying one, we need to buy one with two engines, because what about if one engine goes? Mm. And they're the expensive ones. Yeah, so yeah, so. <laughs> Um, it, it was good, you know. Yeah. It was it was a good experience to do, yeah. and we got we did get our money's worth out of it. I used to use it a lot, um, and they don't half come in handy, but you save a lot of time, especially if you're going long distances and you need to be somewhere quick. You save a lot of time, but I never used to fly myself, so by the time you call, we had three or four different pilots. By the time you call the pilots come in. And they set it up with air traffic control when you when you're landing, where you're taking off, what time you'll be there. You're better off to get in a car and just start driving. Yeah. You know, so it, you don't save that much time. If you know on Tuesday you're leaving at nine o'clock and today is Sunday, and on Tuesday I'm leaving at nine and we're taking the helicopter, then yes, it's the easiest thing in the world. But if I take a phone call to go to Aberdeen, I think, right, I'll take the helicopter. By the time you organize everything, you're not saving too much for the hassle and the cost of what it, you know, because these things don't do 50 mile per gallon. No, they don't. <laughs> no. I, that, I used to fly helicopters, yeah. and that's why I stopped, because you've got to drive to the airfield, which for me is what? Well, there you go. You've experienced the same thing. And then the startup checks and all the planning of the mm -hmm. routes takes half an hour, an hour. Oh, and if the weather's slightly off, you're grounded. You're not going. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, just get, get a driver. And, just get a driver. Yeah. Just get a driver. Are, are there any um, great cars that you can be driven in? What's the best car for being chauffeured in? Mercedes V-Class. Right. Yeah. So better than Rolls Royce Maybach and all yep. that? Really? 100%. Why? Well, when I say Mercedes V-Class, I don't mean a normal Mercedes V-Class. I mean, you can get these custom, we had a couple called a chauffeur jet, these custom where there's only two seats in the back. You have no boot. You have two seats in the back, a partition between the, the driver and the passengers. And you've got your you've got your your, your laptops, you've got your your um, your televisions, mm. your one the last one we had had a coffee machine in it. Um, just and no how problem. much? One hundred and fifty grand. Wow. For a new one. So you get a used one. The last cheap, one I, I sold was for sixty five. Right. Great car. Yeah. I how I ended up getting into that was I lost my driving license. <laughs> Don't know if anyone knew, but yeah, I lost my driving license yeah. and um, I needed to be driven everywhere. And the thing with me is if I, if I take a punt on a client and think, right, he lives three hours away, I'm just gonna go and see him. It, you don't always hit. So if I'm three hours there and three hours back, that's a wasted day. Mm. I'm out of the office. But when I was in my V-class, I was still in the office. Yeah. It had its own Wi-Fi. I had my laptop. I was completely, no one could hear what conversations I was having, you know, talking about prices and, and, and things, yeah. things like that. It, it, was, it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. It was an offer. And that got me through COVID. Let me tell you why. 
Rob Moore would call me in COVID and he'd say, uh, Carl, I haven't spent money on anything for three months. We haven't left the house. I'm depressed. I love cars. I see you've got a Hurricane Performante. I want to buy it, but I want to see it. Okay, well, come and see it. I can't come and see it. It's locked down. Okay. Well, how about I transport it to you? I'll put it on your drive. Yeah, that's fine, Carl, but the missus, she won't have anyone come in the house. She's totally obsessed. She's washing the shopping down at the door, which everyone's wife done, my wife did, washing the shopping bags. You're not allowed in the house. Okay, no problem. Well, I'm going to bring my office and my stock to you. Put the car on his drive. He's going to buy it. It's on his drive. Mm. Car on his drive. I'm parked 100 yards down the road. No one can see me. Rob, come meet me. I'm in a veto. Like, like, a, like, a, like a drug deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a veto around the corner. He'd come in the veto. He'd sit down. We'd have a coffee. We'd have a chat. We're in my office at this point. Mm. Deal done. Bang. Move on. Next day, where are we going? Yeah. Why don't you keep that up then? Well, I had no need to. Right. I don't need to now, but that was the only form of doing business in COVID. Yeah. And we had the whole of the UK to ourselves because no one else was doing it. Yeah. What did I do in COVID? I bought two transporters so I could take my stock to people's address. Yeah. I bought two V classes so me and my dad could go to people's address in our office. Mm. You don't come to us, we'll come to you. Yeah. So yeah, that, um, that worked well. Yeah. Dave Ramsey says you should never get a loan for a car. What do you think about that? Um, well, I'm a bit of a hypocrite here because I don't agree with that, although I wouldn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, so why wouldn't you and why don't you agree with it? Well, I wouldn't because the way we've been brought up extremely old fashioned, really old fashioned, we don't borrow money. Um, and a car is a luxury item that I've always been told if you can't afford, then you don't buy. But the business side of me thinks that's an idiot who said that. <laughs> why not? Why tie up half a million pound in a car where you could take that half a million pound, you would pay 3,000 pounds a month, but I can earn 6,000 pounds a month putting my half a million pounds somewhere else. So it's paying for my car and I'm earning money. That's, that's the way to do it. Mm. What my personal views are, for me, doesn't go for anybody else. It's just the way we've been brought up. And I'm not saying, I'm saying at one point it was the right way. Um, but in today's day and age, I don't think it is the right way. No, I think, I think you should borrow money against cars. A car's an asset. Some cars appreciate. It's no different to borrowing money against a block of flats that you're renting out. The car's going up the same as your rent is coming in. Mm. It's also the cost of the capital that you put into the car, mm -hmm. which you could be using elsewhere that goes up or it could go down in the car. I mean, a great business move would be to buy an appreciating car and borrow money against it. The car's paying for itself. It pays for itself. We, you know, out of 10 cars we sell, I would say people fund seven of them oh wow yep yeah um for different reasons yeah there's three types of people who fund against cars there's business-minded people who realize that putting all my equity into that car is not a good business decision i can earn more elsewhere with it that's number one number two is your first time supercar buyer who wants it for the gram but can't afford it but he can afford 1500 quid 2000 a month he can afford that. He just can't afford the 250 grand for the car. Yeah. That's a problem. He's, he's playing a risky game because he's buying something he can't afford. He is so dependent on the market where if the market drops, he is screwed because he, he's got no equity in the car to get out of. Mm. And then you get the person who borrows money against the car because rates are cheap, but doesn't borrow money against the car when rates are not cheap. So when rates were 6.9%, We've seen a massive increase in people borrowing against the car because it's cheap. When they went to 12.9%, which wasn't long ago, we've seen a complete decrease in people um, financing cars. Mm. But those people who wanted it for the gram, they were still financing the cars. Mm. They, that's, the only, that's the only choice they had. Mm.
Is it true you could pick up, a, say, a mid-range used Ferrari and only have to pay about 700 a month on the repayments? Well, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many great finance deals out there um, that you can have. Um, a, great, a great way to fund a car is an, in, an interest-only deal. So you just pay for the interest. So if you, if you buy a car that is £250,000, for example, then you would have to put in 35%, 35 to 40% as a deposit initially. So you're putting in 100 grand. All you then pay for is the interest. So if the interest, if you're borrowing 100,000 and the interest is 8%, you're paying 8,000 pounds a year Ooh. to borrow the money. And what happens if the car goes down, you have a balloon payment at the end? But you put such a big deposit in that the car is not going to go down lower than the balloon payment that you've already put in. Right. Because you've already put 100,000 in against a 250,000 pound car. The car, that 250,000 pound Ferrari is not going to lose 100,000 in three years. Mm. If it does, you've bought the wrong kind or mm. from the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's, that's a great option, yeah. you know, because you, you, can, you can have that deal for less than a thousand pound a month. Wow. And what's the absolute cheapest way to finance a supercar? To buy it. <laughs> Just right. buy it. It doesn't cost you anything. What about the cheapest finance deal? Cheapest finance deal is interest only. Yeah. Interest only is the cheapest finance deal. Yeah. Can you give us some negotiation tips? You guys, I heard you on the phone. <laughs> You've got the skills. Everybody's different. Every, everybody and every personality is different. What I would say which is a, uh, a, good, a good trait to have, whether I've got it or not, I'm not sure, is you need to be able to adapt to certain people's personality and personas. You, you can't talk to a 25-year-old crypto millionaire the same way you talk to a 65-year-old um, Yorkshire farmer. You, you're not gonna get on. You're not gonna have anything in common. You need to find a common ground. You need to um, you need to have a certain personality to certain different people. Um, so that that's a good negotiating skill. Um, if you can find some kind of a common ground with the person who you're trying to negotiate with, I don't want to do business with someone who I think is an asshole or an idiot. Whether their figures are the right or wrong figures, I automatically have a bit of a barrier up against them. I probably do want to do business with somebody who I get on with quite well and I think they've got a good personality and I quite like talking to them, even though their price isn't exactly where I want them to be, I want to do business with that person because I'm enjoying it, I'm having a, I'm having a good time. Yeah. When someone comes to spend money with me, the first and foremost, the thing that they have to do is enjoy themselves. They have to have a good experience. You're spending money that you've not had a good experience getting because you've worked very hard, tires nights, you know, uh, panic, worry, anxiety, stress. And now you've got this money and you want to spend it, you want to enjoy it. The last thing you want to do is, is make negotiating a chore like, like you're still back at work, you know? So you, you, have, to, you have to let people enjoy spending money. Mm. So, when so you need to cater to their needs, that's what I'm saying. You need right. to make them feel like they're having a good time. Yeah. So when I watched you on, on the phone there before we went live, you offered a price and then you went, so you knew that was low. Well, no, I knew that I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that whatever price I said to that guy, he'd have the same reaction. Right. Because that's his personality. Yeah. So I also know his personality is if I go in at my best, whatever price I said, his reaction would be, F off, that's way <laughs> too low. Right? Whatever it would be. Right. He's a businessman. Yeah. So I have I have to start lower than where I'm going to go with him. Yeah. Because I know where he's going to start. And we always, we always do business. I will buy that car by the end of today. Yeah. But, but when you heard that conversation, my, my offer for the car, when I sort of grimaced a bit, <laughs> um, his reaction was like, no, I'm, I'm, that's it, not for sale, I'm putting the phone down. Well, how long were we on the phone for before he come round to the idea and then wanted to talk about it more and think about it? Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. So... You know, that's, that's a very key three minutes. Yeah. What you say, I want to pay like 350,000 for the car. No, f off car, that's way too low, that's way too low. Oh, okay then, well, um, sorry about that. Uh, good luck, I'll speak to you later. Phone down, you're not buying that car. No. That car's gone. 
but you keep them on the phone, you talk to them, you tell them why the offer is that, you tell them why they can't get an offer anywhere near that, anywhere else, and all of a sudden they think, well, you know what, you're right. I did want a bit more, but you're right. Yeah. Have you ever done a deal and afterwards, whether immediately or when you ended up selling the car, you thought, that guy had my pants down. He was a master. He out-negotiated me. Um, not as extreme as that, no. But I do business with a lot of repeat customers that I know when they've had the better of me on, on a deal. And I'll remind them. <laughs> well, you want it back in the future. Uh, uh, listen, you've had your way this time. Yeah. It's my turn next time. Because if you do so much business with a client, you sell him 10, 12, 15 cars a year. When he comes to you, you want to keep him. Yeah. That's, that's the point. He's your customer. You want to keep him. Mm. So if you're 10,000 pounds away on doing a deal, you've got to give and take. Yeah. You've got to think, you know what? For the sake of it, I'll get it back on the next one. But have I gone fresh to a customer and um, he's had my pants down? Well, if he's sold me a car and I've paid too much for it, then I've had my own pants down. Yeah. This, that's my fault. Um, if he's bought a car from me for less than what I wanted to sell the car for, then once again, he's outsmarted me. That's my problem. Yeah. That's, that's my fault. I, I tend to look at it more as I didn't do my job as well as he did mm. rather than he done his job better than me. Mm. I know it means the same thing, but in my own mind, I look at it differently. So you're taking responsibility. I take the responsibility yeah. completely, yeah. Yeah. If you went broke today, this was all gone, what would you do? Would you start this up all again or would you do something different? I would do what I know how to do and that is to buy and sell things. What I, what I choose to buy and sell predominantly happens to be supercars. Yeah. But I don't, like we talked about earlier, I don't just draw the line there. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm currently um, in negotiations to sell um, some very rare trees to, <laughs> to, to a guy. Um, I bought a car from him this week and he was spending over a million pounds on his garden. And he said, Carl, I can't believe how much these trees are. These trees, um, you know, I'm, I'm giving you 220,000 for trees. So I'm thinking, why are you giving him 220,000 for trees? <laughs> like, why can't, why can't I get you the trees? And that's what I'm doing. Right. Because, because why not? I know how to buy and sell things. Yeah. You know? So there's really nothing you wouldn't buy or sell if you thought you could make money on it. Exactly. I, I don't, I have, I'm not a, um, a materialistic snob that will only buy and sell the top high end stuff. I'll buy and sell toilet roll. <laughs> don't care. But I'll buy and sell a lot of it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't care. You know, I thought about doing more watches because much less storage issues, isn't there? You know, these storing insurance or the charging. Yeah. The, see, the thing is, I do, I do quite a lot with watches that are, that are sort of off the radar kind of thing. I don't advertise them or anything like that. Um, but the reason I don't do more with them is... You attract a different type of, um, I don't want to buy and sell a stainless steel Rolex because there's no money in it. It costs me more money to do the transaction than what the profit is in these watches. How some of these watch dealers function on buying and selling watches for less than 10,000 pounds is beyond me. They must have to sell the hundreds of them a week in order to make it worthwhile. The big stuff, the big stuff is where the money is. Mm. And the big stuff is where my clients are. Mm. The Richard Mills, the Patek Philippe's, that's where my, my clients are. So they're a rare watch to start off with. Mm. So who do you know that stocks 10 Richard Mills and 20 Pateks? Nobody. No. I'll make Kieran probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, that's, that, that, that's why. Mm. You take it when they come. Yeah. What are the biggest mistakes when you spec a car that people make? Um, the biggest mistake I think you could make when you spec a car is to, in this, in, to spec it too individually to what you want. Right. Your taste, you might have a very individual taste. And because it's your car and you're specking it for you, which I, which I take my hat off to, um, 
what you've done is you've made it nigh on impossible to sell. You're not going to have this car forever. You might have it for a season, you know, and then you want to sell it. And then you're worried about why you can't sell it because it's brown. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why it's brown and you didn't put any carbon fiber on it. You know, you were the one in a hundred people that wants that color or wants that spec. And now you're looking for the other one in a hundred people. Mm. You know, you're making it hard. So what I, when you're specking a car, I think you have to, you have to look at what car you're specking in and why you're, why you're ordering this car. Is this going to be a lifer? Is this going to be, I don't care if I ever sell it. I always want to keep it. If that's so, then just crack on. Yeah. Or the pink with brown interior, who cares? Yeah. Um, but if you think, you know what, I'm going to have this car for a year or so and then I'll, I'll swap it for, it's a stopgap between this and what I really want. Don't go too individual. Mm. Just go, you know, buy a red Ferrari, put black inside of it, put some carbon on it and suspension lifter. You're going to be happy with that. If you don't like red, order black. Don't order a special order uh, cream, you know, because like out exterior, because mm. you might like it, but you're having it for six months. Try yeah. and find somebody else. There's a reason this car's rare mm. in this color. Because no one wants it. Mm. That's why. And are there things that you can spec a car on that are better for the value and things that are worse for the value? Yeah, of course. Once again, different brands, different cars, different extras. Um, carbon fiber across the board on, on a supercar really is a must. Yeah. Um, as much as you can. You can go stupid. You can overspec a car and then you lose more because you put too much carbon fiber on the car. Mm. So there's a happy medium there somewhere. Um, suspension lifter on Ferraris and Lambos is, is vital, really. Um, Ferraris are not too low, but Lambos are, mm. as you know. Yeah. Um, so you need the suspension <laughs> yeah. lifter. Um, and, you know, colors. Colors. You can, you can hit the jackpot and you can go really individual and order a real color that no one's got the balls to order, but everyone loves it. And then you've got the only one. But you can also, it can also flip the other way and you can go, you can go too individual and no one wants it. And, and right now, what's the hot supercar color? Uh, depends what car. Between Christmas and New Year, I bought a, now try and picture this, it looked amazing. A bright orange metallic Ferrari 488 Spider with a black stripe painted. Now this wasn't like, a color called Rosso Dino, which is like an orangey red. This was a Rancho. This was um, a Lamborghini orange, special order. It was a tailor-made car. I'm looking at this car in an underground car park. This is in between Christmas and New Year. There's like two inches of sleet on the floor. And I'm thinking, what am I doing buying an orange Ferrari? It looks great, but my head won't let me accept that it looks great. But took the chance, bought the car. It was very chancy. Went for a meal in London afterwards with a friend. Got home at 1.30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning, I'm in the bath. I sold the car in the bath. <laughs> Why? This guy was after an orange Ferrari. Not another one. And he paid a premium for it. Yeah. But I didn't pay a premium for it. Because for me, it wasn't a premium. It was a, it was a car that was sub-premium. Yeah. Because it wasn't red. Yeah. But the guy who wants an orange one pays a premium for it. Yeah. What's your worst nightmare customer experience you've had? Uh, I had one recently, actually. Um, I had one recently. We, like I said before, we try and give people a, a really enjoyable experience when they come here. But you can get people, liberty takers, which is exactly what this guy is. He is a liberty taker. You give him an inch, he wants a mile. So he bought a used car that had a couple of tools. That, do you use the tools in your car? <laughs> do you know where they are? You We're not in 1953 anymore. <laughs> You're not taking a spanner anywhere near your car, right? <laughs> I know that for a fact. But some cars come with these sort of, there's a few fuses. Mm few little light bulbs, like you've got to change the light bulb yourself. A few fuses, a few little light bulbs, a spanner, and a little screwdriver. I mean, these are, these are, these are, no one even knows they're even there. Mm. Anyway, the guys had the car for, I'll tell you what car it was, and you'll understand. But I bet you haven't even got it. 
Do you have the white gloves that come with your Lamborghini Aventador? <laughs> Not Michael Jackson. <laughs> There's a set of white gloves that you put on whilst you service your own Lamborghini Aventador, <laughs> right? So this guy's bought a 10 year old, really, really value for money, like the cheapest Aventador money can buy. He's had a great deal on it, but it's a good car. Been serviced, everything's great with the car. Six months later, He's called me and he's told me that his white gloves are not in the car <clears throat> and there's a few spanners missing out the tool section in the car. So I said like, okay, unfortunately, in the six owners that the car has had and the 10 years it's been on the road, they've, they've obviously just gone missing. But, you know, I guarantee you, if you've seen a year old car, them gloves might be missing. Some might not even come with them. Most of them do. And he was like, oh, it's no problem, I, 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 I just want a new set. Okay. I went to Lamborghini, 710 pounds. <laughs> 710 pounds. For a pair of white gloves. For a pair of white gloves and a spanner, <laughs> right? That was the worst thing I could have done with this customer. That was the worst thing I could have done. Because you taught him you'll run around after him. Yeah, and... I gave him an inch yeah. and he's trying to take a mile. And- What else did he want then? Well, now, now he's found, a couple of stone chips. He's had the car for six months, by the way. There's a couple of stone chips. I want, I could, I'd like the, I didn't expect a car to come from Tom Hartley with, uh, with a few stone chips underneath the, uh, the lip of the car. I'd like them um, respraying. So the car's done 24,000 miles. You know, you've had it for six months. How do I know that you've done the stone chips? No, I'm going to write a Google review and I'm going to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you, you're taking liberties now. You know, you, you've, you've had the car, you've had a detailer come around and washed it and gone, oh, you've got a couple of stone chips on your car. And he's gone, oh, I'm not having that. What you should do, my friend, is give another 300,000 and buy a new car. That's what you should do. Because a used car isn't for you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the worst thing I could have done, I think I would have completely nipped it in the bud if I'd have just said, Unfortunately, the car was never advertised. I went down the, you know, corporate route. Unfortunately, it was never advertised with gloves and a spanner. So, you know, you don't get gloves and a spanner. I'm really sorry. I hope, you know, I hope you're still okay with it. But, and just cut him off. That's mm. what I should have done. But I'm not that person. Mm. He was kicking up a fuss. I thought, you know what? I, w I will go and buy him the fucking gloves. And, <laughs> and, and you get no more thanks. No. You get... Trek worse. So you get experiences like that. I never really get a bad experience from somebody saying that, um, because if they buy a car from me and they don't like the car, that's not my fault. They can't complain to me because they've made a decision to buy a car. And we're not talking about people here. We're not talking about schoolboys. We're talking about CEOs. We're talking about chairman, directors. We're talking about wealthy, you know, high net worth people. They understand, you know, I bought the wrong car. It don't go up my drive. Mm. My drive's too steep. Bought the wrong car. Carl, you've sold me the wrong car. <laughs> no, you bought the wrong car. You don't get that conversation. Yeah. You get conversations from people who um, have a car for three or four or five months and the battery goes flat and then they want to have a go at you down the phone because their battery's gone flat. But it's gone flat, sir, because you didn't put it on charge mm. and you haven't used it for six weeks. That's not my fault. No. But I'll still send my text out to your address and plug a charger in for you, if that's what you want me to do. And yeah. I've done that. Yeah. But you give them an inch, they take a mile. Mm. Welcome to the world of retail. <laughs> yeah. Right, rank these in order, Ooh. and why? Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche, McLaren. Best, worst to best, and why? <laughs> I think you've got to give me models here. We're talking top of the Just range. Just talking the make of car. All right, well, okay, so Ferrari's number one, because Ferrari is, just the best brand in the whole world. It's the family, the brand, the, the, the whole thing of owning a Ferrari is, you, you, it's just different, it's just different. Um, Lamborghini, there's Lamborghini owners out there that will watch this and go, God, well, Lamborghini's the best. <laughs> because, you know, they are great cars, they sound great, but in my opinion, they're not a Ferrari. Um, but do they look better? Do they look, yeah, they look better. Of course they look better. They sound better, they look better. Yeah. They don't drive better, um, in my opinion. But, you know, 
doors go up, which is always a plus. Um, I'm going to throw, you see, there's no card which I like to say is the worst, but neither of, neither of, um, neither Porsche nor McLaren can compete with Ferrari and Lamborghini. McLaren make incredibly good cars. They've got incredibly bad after sales. Um, McLaren as a company are their own worst enemy. They make as good a car as anybody, but their company is a complete shit show. A complete shit show. Um, so you probably have to say that they're the worst. Porsche uh, is boring as hell. I wouldn't have one. You couldn't give me one. It's boring. Just... You, you were just telling me the Turbo S, you know, the Great car. car. Yeah. Does exactly what it says on the tin. In every... Boring as hell. You imagine going home to a woman every night at the same time and having the same dinner cooked in the same way, <laughs> which is perfect, by the way. Your steak is perfect. Yeah? You go with the same thing every single day. It's the same thing. Every single day it does the same thing. It does exactly what you expect and no more. God, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> but a Porsche owner is like, that's exactly what I want. Yeah. You know, it's my personality. I want something that is, you know, I, I, I don't... I want so why to be... don't you put McLaren before Porsche then? Why doesn't McLaren go because they're Because of the way their company is. The way McLaren is as a company. McLaren make better cars than Porsche. Because Andrew Tate said to me, he's got 59 cars, and he said the 765... Is it 765S? LT. Yeah, the um, mm -hmm. McLaren is the best driving car out there. He's not wrong. It's incredible. Absolutely insane. And their cars are incredible value for money. And they lose a lot of money. They do, which means you can get them cheaper. Do you know why they lose money? Because they're shit to um, run. No, the people who are running them are shit. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, you like, know. Yeah. The service centres, the aftercare. The cost of a, a wing or... Well, it's not so much that. It's... it's um, Okay, they built a model called a McLaren 570, which is the lower range model of a McLaren. It's, you know, it's a really good value for money car. It sort of competes with a Porsche Carrera 4S GTS kind of thing. Doesn't compete with a Ferrari. Doesn't compete with a Lamborghini. It's sort of, it's in between your, 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 your sports car and your supercar kind of thing, you know? It's like an R8 mm. kind of thing. I don't know what they painted them with, but they corroded to hell, these cars. Every panel after a year is blistered and covered and... and absolutely caked in corrosion. Wow. So McLaren, it's under warranty. They, they, they will respray them. They will respray them if you wait 12 months for them to get it in. Then when they've got it in, they'll take another six months to respray it. And then they'll, you'll somehow get a bill. I don't know why, but you will. They're just, the company's awful. The company, they make such good cars. And I'm a fan of McLaren's. What Andrew said is completely right. That, that um, 765 is a great car. A P1, is that one a P1 yeah. is a different class car to a 918 Spider? Is it different class? As in much better? As in can't be even compared? How? Why? Is it as better? a driver car, because a, a, a 918 is is a great car, but it's like it's a Porsche. It's boring. It goes really fast, but I could drive that car as fast as my wife could drive the car. The same as Lewis Hamilton could drive the car. There's there's no driver ability in that car. It's just one to go, one to stop, and it goes. Just super fast and it stops super quick and that's it. There's no theatre, there's no noise, there's no nothing. If I was a neutral, I'm not a neutral because I'm a Ferrari fan. If I was a neutral, I would say a P1's a better car than a LaFerrari. Why? It drives better. How? Just the engagement that you have. That car wants to kill you. That car is um, an F40. It's a modern day F40. I said once on a, a, I've done a YouTube video, it drives, it drives like... You've shagged its wife and smacked its kids. <laughs> like that, that's, that's what the car drives like. It's insane. <laughs> it's, it, you know, that's, that's the feeling it gives you. Why is this car so mad with me for? <laughs> you know? A 918 just wants to be your friend, you know? Wants to make sure that you're okay. Yeah. You know? LaFerrari is dead bang in the middle, but I'm a Ferrari fan, and I will say LaFerrari is a better car for me because I prefer them. Yeah. McLaren make great cars. Porsche make fantastic cars. I don't feel Porsche makes supercars. What do they make? Sports cars. With supercar performance. Does that not then put the supercars to shame? The fact that... 
they make sports cars with supercar performance, a bit like the GTR. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, but they, they, they've... <laughs> There's only so much you can do with a 911. A 911's been the same shape. Yeah, but they do loads years. of things with it, with the amount of model variations there are. It's still a 911. Okay, it's got a bigger wing. It still does exactly... It just, it just does everything perfectly. Do you want that in, in your fun car that you take out once, twice a week? Do you want that reliability? I think yes. I don't want to break down all the time. No, no not break down. But what I mean is, do you want a car that excites you? Yeah. A Porsche's not going to do that. No. To be excited in a Porsche, you have to do 200 miles an hour. To be excited in a, a Ferrari or a McLaren or a Lamborghini, you could be the same excited doing half the speed because of the noise yeah. and because of the theatre and because of the, the pops and the downshifts and, you know, the way, the way, the way it feels. Mm. And the doors go up on McLarens and the doors go up on Lamborghinis and your Ferrari's got that you know, Ferrari badge and it's made in Italy and somebody, you know, someone was having a cigarette when they were putting their interior <laughs> together. You know, where, you know, you go over to Porsche and the Germans, they make them perfectly and everything's, everyone's spotless in white suits and, you know, mm. it just for me, Porsche is a great car. You're an idiot to say that they 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 don't do a great job, but I don't want a I don't want a fun car that does a great job. Mm. You know. Mm. So what's the best supercar that's the most fun that is really unpopular? Because well, unpopular is McLaren. If you said what is the best supercar which is the most fun, you can name ten. If you said what is the best supercar, which is the most fun, which is unpopular, is a McLaren. But it's not the car's fault. It's the idiots who run the company. Right. And the idiots who work in the dealerships. Whether, it's, whether they're getting orders from further up, I don't know. But they are useless. They have no idea how to run a company. Mm. What about the best supercar that everyone else thinks is a dog? Because you like something with a bit of character. So what's actually a bit shit to drive or hard to drive or full of problems, but you love it. Um, well, I can reverse that and I can tell you that the best supercar that's full of problems that people love, but I, I don't love, is a Koenigsegg. Um, Koenigsegg have created um, cars that are mind-bogglingly fast and powerful and, you know, they, they look good, but they just, my experience with the models that I've had, they just don't work. Right. They just don't work. Um, and that, that's, that's a problem. Um, you get all sorts of people, they like these, uh, like, um, spikers. And, I mean, they're just shit. They're just, you know, you just stay away from them. You just, you, you want a car that is, you know, you want to look at who you're buying a car from. You know? This company, Ferrari. Ferrari or Ferrari. Ferraris have problems. But they're Ferrari. They know how to deal with them. Porsche... Porsche don't really have problems. <laughs> Porsche, they're too reliable. Yeah. yeah, they're too reliable. Yeah. What are the three best supercars? Maserati. Ma you got one down there, haven't you? Yeah, love it. Do you? Not many people do. I think it's great. Why do you love it? Tell us the model. The MC20. Yeah. Stradale. Weird looking thing. Uh, do you think so? Well, I mean, how something looks is subjective, but yeah. yeah, it looks a bit weird. Well, I like it, and I think it drives really well, and um, I did a few miles in that car, and I thought, you know what? People don't like this car because they've never drove it. Right. Drives nice, sounds good. Yeah. I think it looks good. People just look at Maserati as, because their, their reputation precedes them, they look at them, oh, they're going to be a pig, they're going to lose money, they're going to break down. Well, they don't. Mm. They do lose money. Yeah. I mean, that one's got a 100,000 discount on it. Right. Um, but so how much is that one? 175. Right. And it was 275 new. 275 new. Yeah. And it's uh, six months old. Wow. Yeah. A lot of car for the money. Wouldn't want to be the first owner of that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to be the second owner of that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I think they're a great car. Yeah. Um, the way cars are built in today's day and age, and this is why I give McLaren a lot of stick, and I like McLaren. But the way they're built in today's day and age, there's no room for error. You know, cars have to be perfect. They have to always be reliable. They have to do 50,000 miles without needing a service. Mm. They have to, you know, they're built with such high standards that when a car such as a McLaren has a, an issue, 
Like Aston Martin are the same, by the way. Aston Martin going like in cahoots with Mercedes have, have done a great, great move there because Mercedes are very much like Porsche. They're very, they're very efficient. Mm. Um, Aston Martin, Maserati, McLaren. They're three unloved models, brands. Yeah. And um, they shouldn't be. I've got a DBS. I picked mm -hmm. one up recently. 300 new. I gave 130s mm -hmm. for it. I mean, it hasn't gone wrong yet, but I've only had, not even had it a But it year. won't go wrong. Oh, but the, how it looks and how it sounds. Yep. Do you, are, are you still looking for that magical button, though, that gives it more speed? I daren't do anything with that car. It is so twitchy. 700 horsepower I know, in the rear. but when I, drive, yeah. when I drive an Aston Martin and a DBS, yeah. good car, it's V12. It's 700 brake horsepower. Yeah. I mean, you're thinking, Christ, this is a... This is a that thing twitches in seventh gear. This is, an yeah. eight, this is an 812. This is a Ferrari 812, but I just don't find them that fast. No. I find loads of power, yeah. but no. I'm, like, I drive the car and I'm like, is there, is, I'm, I'm, is there a button here somewhere? Well, you, you, can't, you can't put the power down on that car, no. can you? No, it, it's, You um, can't, it's too dangerous. It, 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 it can't hold the road at all. And what but, a good value for money car. Yeah, but if you, it, I mean, it's, I see it more as a cruiser. It's more a GT, as a GT car. GT, exactly. Yes, is, That's yeah. how I see it for what it is. So I didn't buy it because I want to rag it. I bought it because I had the Panamera Turbo S, which I loved. And for five years, I couldn't find anything better. So I wanted something different. I run this it. This was your daily? Yeah, I just run Because I do no miles would daily. You buy a, four would you miles buy, here, four miles there. Would you there. buy a Porsche as your special car? As your, like, weekend car? Well, I did get the 911 Turbo off you, the 1989 Yeah, but that's, that's a classic. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd get a classic 911 no, on about, Turbo. No, I'm on about, would you buy a new or nearly new Porsche Carrera 4S as your Sunday. No, but you could buy the GT3 RS, couldn't you? Would you not feel like an idiot with that wing on the back? Well, Wait, that like, P1's got the great big yeah, wing but on yeah, the back. I can put it down. Yeah, would I not feel an idiot with the wing well, on like, the back? Well, like, where are you going? No. <laughs> you got your roll cage most and your, your harnesses. Look, most of your cars here have big wings on the back. Yeah, look but, at that. I mean, that's, that's a track car. Right, okay. Okay, that's a track car. What is, what is that one? That's a Porsche GT2 RS with a big massive wing. Yeah, and then the Merc. That's an SLS GT3. Right. Um, then you got the um, Ferrari 296, the Ford GT spoiler goes down. Yeah. P1 spoiler goes down. Right. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I personally wouldn't choose a GT3 RS. It depends RS. what you're... It depends. No, I, I agree with you. I think I never got into Porsche until quite late. I'd had Ferraris and Lambos before because I thought, well, the bog standard 911 is the same car as the GT3 RS or whatever, mm -hmm. but you're paying double or triple so anyone can get a 911 but it's nothing special to get the gt3 rs which is essentially the same car now my business partner likes that about them because of the continuity and the engineering no i'd get something more special i mean i'm finding it hard to find a better looking car than my aventador it's very hard i think it's it's, very they hard. sound Amazing. Mm -hmm. It's got a shit gearbox, but it's awful. Um, but, but, but I'm happy. But to live this with it. is the character of it. This is when you I'm put saying. it in automatic, it is like a boat move. It's, it's like having a box. beautiful woman with an awful attitude. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The gearbox is. Shit. I don't care. She can't cook. I don't care. Yeah, Look at her. Looks amazing. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Every time I get in that car, I remember why I love it. I mean, even the Revolto, it looks a bit more engineered and controlled. Do you know what? I've, I've not driven one. But... I've not driven one and I've not spent enough time in person looking at one. I've seen one at like the opening launch, but there were 500 people there mm. and you couldn't really have a bit of time to look at the car. But I think, I, I think Lamborghini are very much like Ferrari where there's a lot of pressure on their new V12 model mm. and they nail it every time. Mm. They get it right every single time. Yeah. I mean, how... How do you look at an Aventador, like say let the last variation, which was an SVJ, how do you look at a car that dramatic and that beautiful and think, right, we, we've got to make the next one better than this? Mm. Yeah, that's not easy. That's pressure. But they nail it every time. Yeah. They nail it every single time. But Ferrari do the same. They have to, don't they? They have. That's the yeah. job. Yeah. You know, that's the, that's the job. Yeah. If you can't do it, we'll, you're sacked. We need someone else who yeah. can. That, that's what you're here for. You know? Yeah. That's why you're a designer. No, no artist, no designer have ever made a car and gone, 
that's it. Yeah. Can't beat that. No. <laughs> you know, yes, there always is. There always is something else. Yeah. Um, the Ferrari, the new LaFerrari. We call it a new LaFerrari, but it's going to be the, 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 the successor to the LaFerrari. Um, is sort of being tested now in, in Italy. There's test mules, all you know, black mm. coverings on it and stuff. No one knows what it looks like, but I can guarantee you they're going to nail it. Yeah. They always do. They always will. Mm. So best three supercars? Third to first. Brands? No, actual cars. Oh. Like you can only have three supercars. You can only stop three supercars. You can only drive three supercars. Okay. Uh, number one... Um, number one for me at the minute is a, a Ferrari SF90. You got three of them, then. yeah. Absolutely love them. Is that because you got three of them? And I, you think need to get I think that I think they're cheap. I you think, think they're, they're cheap at three eighty. I think they're cheap at sub below four hundred grand. I think they're cheap. Yeah. You get a thousand brake horsepower, rear engine, V eight, low numbered Ferrari. How many and of those are made? Well, they made them for it. They didn't number them as in, you know, one of 500 or one of whatever, but yeah. there's rumours there was a thousand. Right. Which is not many. No. And it's, you know, it's a thousand brake horsepower. It looks, I think they look nice. Do you think they look nice? Well, I didn't because I thought they looked like a, a Corvette, an American car, but it's always the way where you have to see them in the flesh. You'll see them in the flesh. Yeah, yeah you have to. So, and yeah, no, I, um, I think that they look good. I mean, colour wise, I probably wouldn't have those colours, but I think they, I think they look pretty good. Yeah, um, they're big, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I've thrown an SF90 in there. I would throw in a... I mean, we're talking supercars, we're talking money, no object here. You pick. All right, let's start again. Let's go money, no object. Okay. Any car. Yeah, Th best three cars, money, no object, and then we'll do best three. Yeah, supercar. yeah, best three cars, money, no object. Um, Bugatti Chiron Super Sport. How much are they now? Five? Five. Yeah. Five million. Um, Have you driven one? No. No, I've driven every other variant but that. Um, surprisingly, uh, if we're talking about sort of new new cars, I'm not going to throw in um, the new Pagani, uh, although I love the brand more than any other brand. Uh, I don't really like the new Pagani. If I'm honest, I had the option to buy a car. They saved me a slot. Um, I said to Horatio when we launched the car, and he said, you know, you've got a slot if you want one. I said, would you, how would you feel about me having the car, having the slot, and, you know, it not be a long-term thing, like me, me selling it? He said, well, I'd rather you not, because I want to sell it to somebody who is going to keep it as a long-term thing. Obviously, not everyone does. Mm. But I was honest about the situation, because yeah. I respect him and the brand so much. So if that's how you feel, I would I would rather let someone else have it. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I passed up probably somewhere between half a million and a million pounds profit right. on that car to not want to upset somebody who I've got a lot of respect and time for. Yeah. And admire him mm. and his brand. Um, so I'm not going to put that in there. I put the Bugatti in there. Um, Ferrari um, SP3 Daytona. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's 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 a good car. Yeah, and um, and then we could throw in. I just you know I just want to kind of want to kind of stay with Ferrari, you know I want to I want to put in an older model a LaFerrari in there, mm. a LaFerrari Aperta, because right. they're just you know, I think they've just got it locked at that level. Yeah, you know, and then the best three. Kind of more everyday supercars, if you like. Okay, let's chuck in an SF90, a Lamborghini SVJ Roadster, and, you know, a McLaren 765 LT. Don't you think, though, that the SVJ Roadster is a few little panels and a couple of extra horsepower and a rather um, cosmetically enhanced look version of the Aventador? It's, I have the Aventador. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> Uh, and I, I could not see the benefit of paying, what, 150 or whatever more and don't actually think it looks better. I think it looks worse. Mixed like opinion. Mixed big lips. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, yeah, fillers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I quite like that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, I get it. 
I get it. Uh, an SVJ is um, is is an Aventador with with a pair of fake tits and some fillers. <laughs> yeah, it is. But you know, and an, and the arse done. and the arse done. Yeah, everything yeah. done. Yeah, just everything done. Yeah, it? but you. Why would you put that over the Aventador? Because of the the value. No, I think um, it gives you a. You know, there's a lot more. It, it drives a lot different. Okay. Yes, the gearbox is still a bit. Sh- but it's a big improvement from the earlier S- S- um, Aventadors. Yeah. Um, I think in the right colours, I don't think you should have an SVJ in a bright colour. I think they have to be in a matte black or yeah. matte grey or dark grey or something like that. I think they look sinister. They sound great. And, you know, it's just that whole thing of the Lamborghini V12 doors up. Mm. That's what a supercar should be all about, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. A supercar should be something that my six-year-old boy draws and goes, Daddy, look at that. And it doesn't exist, but one day someone will make a car like that because yeah. that's what your fantasy is. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Who's the youngest client you've ever had or the youngest someone's come in and dropped a load of money on a car? Well, there was a story that I'm not going to tell again because some, um, I think they're fans of mine. Um, another car dealership told the exact same story. On well, no, you tell it then. Well, it's your story. You tell well, it. Well, I told I told it to you before. Tell it was it to on me your again. it was on your last the last one we done together. So what you think they've copied it? Do you? No, they haven't. I don't think they've copied it. Listen, it's it's tell a us for, the story. it's a form of flattery. These guys yeah, obviously they look up to me. Yeah. And um and I appreciate that. And whenever they want pictures or autographs, that you know, them, I'm here. My door's open. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Come on, tell us the story then. So okay, so uh, one day. Um, I'm in the office, it's quite late at night, I'm just about to leave and go home. And uh, my, my assistant calls me through and she said, Carl, there's a guy on the phone, uh, his name is, I won't disclose his name, but his name is whatever, and he's interested in the Lamborghini that you ha- we have. Okay, <clears throat> I've answered the phone as I do. Good evening, Carl speaking, can I help? The minute he opened his voice, I knew he was nine years old, right? So I was like, I feel like saying to my PA, like, are you stupid or something? Did you not know this is a child? Obviously, he just wants to have a conversation, which is fine, by the way. But anyway, I got talking to him and I never said a word for about 20 seconds. And he was talking. And as he was talking, I thought, fuck me. Everything he was saying and every question he wanted to know and ask about this specific car, it was a Urus, um, was exactly what a buyer would, would ask and say. So I thought, well, wow, okay. So I'm talking to him and I'm telling him all the, all the information that he wants and I'm talking to him exactly as I would talk to you or anybody else who I would surmise are, is at an age where they can buy this car. But also he reminded me of me because I was his age doing the same thing. And sometimes I got took seriously and sometimes I didn't. But I always remember the people who did. And long story short, because the story can drag on. Long story short, um, he said, okay. He said, look, if you can deliver the car, um, I'll have it. So I said, okay. I said, that's no problem. I said, the next step is this. I said, I'm going to need some money. And I'm pretty sure you haven't got a debit or a credit card to give me as a deposit. So do you want to call your mom or dad and tell them to call me? Yep, that's exactly what I'll do. I'll call my mum and she's going to call you soon. Okay, well, look, really nice speaking to you, Carl. I've watched all your videos. Well, I said, really nice speaking to you as well. Have a good night. Put the phone down. I thought, what a nice kid. Do you know what I mean? It took five minutes out of my life to, to, to be nice. And like, how knowledgeable. He was very knowledgeable. Anyway, 10 minutes has gone by. I'm still getting wrapped up to leave. My PH called me again. Hi, Carl. There's a lady on the phone who said that she is the mum of the, the, the kid you just spoke to. So I said, okay, all right. Got on the phone. Still never thought no more of it. Got on the phone. Hi, how you doing? You okay? Yeah, Carl, look, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out to, to speak to my son. He watches all your videos. He loves cars and he didn't think he was going to speak to you and he did. And I just want to say thank you. You know, you give him the time and that's really nice of you. Thank you. That's awesome. no, no worries at all. I just said I used to do the same when I was a kid. She said, right, uh, this car, he said, I need to give you a deposit for it. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> well, how much do you want? So I told her, okay, no problem. I'll, um, 
I'll sort that out. Bang, notification through on my phone, you've just received 25,000 deposit for this car. I'm like, no, that's unbelievable. Anyway, story gets better, and I don't know if I told this part of the story on the, next, on the show that we were on. About a week later, it's time for them to collect the car. So they're coming out, and I, w I want to meet this kid now. He's absolutely <laughs> like, he's blew my mind. I want to meet this kid. So um, he's come out to the showroom, met him, met his mum, met his dad. That morning, I'd been to Cheshire and bought a Bugatti Chiron Sport, a special edition, one of eight, um, um, matte grey with a tan interior and a white painted stripe down, down the front of it. And the guys have just done a, a reel to put it on Instagram and just doing the pictures to get it on the web. It's been in stock for one hour. It's been parked in the corner where that yellow SF90 is. The Eurus is on the glass floor. These buyers have come in. The guy came over to me. He said, um, was that the car that was in Bugatti Manchester recently? I said, um, I said I'm not sure. He said, I've seen it there getting serviced. Um, I said, well, it will be because it's one of eight. It's the only one in the UK that that's this edition. Um, and it did come from Cheshire. So there's a very good chance it was, yeah. He said, I asked the salesman if, um, if that was on sale and I wanted to have a look at it. And he told me not to touch the car and uh, to stay away from it. He said, I, I think he felt like I wasn't serious. So he said, how much is it? So I told him it was you know, 4.2 million. Just 4.2 million. Okay. Will you take four million for it? These guys have come to pick up a Eurus and they're only here because I spoke to their nine-year-old kid for five minutes on the phone. So I, was, I can't take four million for it. Like it's it's, you know, it's 200,000 pounds saving. But I'll meet you in the middle. <laughs> Done. <laughs> so that kid was responsible for them to, for, for that family buying those, buying those two cars. And if I would have been 99 out of a uh, 100 people on a Friday night at six o'clock. Hi, I'm interested in the Euros. I'd have went, oh, not today, mate. That's what everyone would have done. Yeah. But I didn't. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the answer to the question, what was the youngest? Obviously, Nine. he never bought the, uh, he never bought the cars, but he was responsible for them. Yeah. But I've sold loads of cars to 17 year olds. Have you? Yeah. 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 I've sold loads of cars to uh, people um, who buy cars for presents for the kids that are still in school and done well on their exams. Wow. So what's the most expensive car you sold to a 17 year old? Um, I, well, at the time, uh, it was a lot more expensive than what they are now. Uh, it was a, an SLR, a Mercedes SLR McLaren, 300,000. To a 17 year old? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, a lot of 17 year olds, 18 year olds buy Ferraris for a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. You know, Bentley's Range Rovers. How do they make their money? Do they have a common thing? Uh, well, obviously, crypto has been <laughs> a, a big reason for yeah. it recently. Uh, influencers, Instagram, social media, yeah. um, OnlyFans. You've sold cars to OnlyFans models? Not OnlyFans models, but people who run their OnlyFans oh, accounts. <laughs> they're the ones really making the money. Yeah, they're the ones really making the money. So when everyone is messaging this woman who they think is messaging them back, they're really messaging my mate. <laughs> <laughs> and he's messaging them back and he's like yeah Shit. do you want a picture <laughs> they're taking 50% it's a great business wow <laughs> what's a story you've never shared or a secret you've never told so in regards to business anything you like uh, anything I like to tell <laughs> or don't like to tell yeah. me that it's just popped well I don't want head. anything that's going to get me arrested <laughs> <laughs> Um, something that I don't often say that people, um, people never talk about is, uh, I enjoy my work. I enjoy my business. Um, I enjoy coming to work, but I only come to work for a reason. And that reason is to, to make money, you know? And people think when someone says something like that, it's quite a crass, quite a crude thing to say, like, oh my God, don't you love your job? Yeah, of course I do, but I wouldn't love it if I didn't earn any money. You know, that, that's, that's, that's something that people need to get out there. I, I interviewed a new salesman uh, last night and he said, Carl, I'm going to be quite straightforward. He said, I'm really money driven. He said, I like cars. He said, but I like money better. And I thought, you know what? That's the best thing you could have said to me. Mm. 
because I'm not going to employ you for you to love cars. <laughs> you know, you know, I haven't sold a car this week, but oh God, I love them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, you, you need to have that in business. I mean, your podcasts are, are predominantly business based. We're talking, we're not talking about the love of cars here, or the love of watches. We're talking about the love of business. And the love of business means what? Money. Money, exactly. To love money. Exactly. Yeah, not right, to love money, money, but to love making it. Yeah. You know? So um, that's something that, it's not a secret, but for those people out there who think that um, I dedicate my whole life to this business, and I do dedicate my heart, and always have dedicated my whole life to this business, it's not for the love of cars. <laughs> <laughs> But I do love cars. Yeah. So Andrew Tay, apparently, according to what he said to me last weekend, has got 59 cars worth $75 million. What do you think about that? Well, I could do the list of them cars because I don't know how he's got, I know some of the cars he's got. 59 cars, $79 million, average price being $1.4 million. Hmm. Don't know. I mean, he does, he says he's just bought the new Pagani for five. Bought the Pagani's three. He said 5.1. He showed me a picture. It's good. It had it all like... Well, unless he hasn't bought it from Pagani. Unless he's bought it from... Uh, um, Probably the, more the like The likes of me, yeah. for instance. So, yeah, that, that could happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah two Jumeras. Yeah. So, you think that valuation of his supercar collection is a bit... No, when you, when, you, when you break it down, he's got, you know, he's got, the, he's got the Chiron, which is probably four and a half million pounds, six million dollars. Um... He's got the Pagani that he's, he must, he, he hasn't got it yet, I don't think. Has he, does he physically have it? Or he showed he... me a picture of it. I mean, he hasn't physically got a lot of his cars because no. he's stuck in Romania. <laughs> yeah. So they're in, I think he gets a lot of them from Dubai. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, he yeah, probably has. Mm. Have you, uh, has Andrew Tate ever bought a car from you? No. Would he's you never like bought him a as a client? Him. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to meet him, you know. Yeah. I'd like to meet him and his brother. Mm. I, um, they, they get, they get a lot of, they get a lot of bad press. Um, they get a lot of good press. Um, they get a lot of press. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think he... I think he's extremely influential. I think he's what the world needs. I think he's what a young man in this world growing up needs. He doesn't necessarily hit the nail on the head every time. But I think his intentions are right. And why I like him um, is because... He's, he's unscripted and he isn't politically correct and he says how he feels, which I think is a trait that not many people have these days, especially people in the media. They don't have that freedom to say what they think. Mm. Do you sometimes worry about saying what you really think and it damaging your business or being Yeah, cancelled? of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. You have to, you have to, I have a personality um, and I won't lose that whoever I upset, but at the same time, we all have our own personal thoughts about things. Um, and sometimes they're just better off to keep to yourself. <laughs> like what? <laughs> <laughs> the ones that need to be kept to myself. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you can agree or you cannot agree with the way certain people do certain things. But at the end of the day, it's none of your business. Yeah. It doesn't stop you from having an opinion. An opinion is like an asshole. Everyone's got one, <laughs> yeah. you know? But it's when you tell somebody they're not allowed to have an opinion. Mm. That's, what I have, that's what I have a problem with. Yeah. Someone's opinion of me can be whatever they want it to be. It's theirs. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. I, do, I, do I really want them to, to like me? Do I really want them to dislike me? The matter of the fact is, I don't really care too much. No. Because I'm never going to change it. Yeah. So a lot of sources online seem to conflict each other about whether Tom Hartley is a billionaire. Is Tom Hartley a billionaire? I suppose you'll have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you'll have to ask him. Um, is he a billionaire? Uh, like I say, I, I, he keeps his cards very close to his chest. So he doesn't even tell his son? I wouldn't have a clue how much money my dad's worth. Really? Yeah, I wouldn't have a clue. Wow. I, could, I would guarantee you it would be more than what I think because right. of his mannerisms and the way he... The way he is he's not a flamboyant person by no means no. at all. Um, he he's very very grounded. He's um, he's he's very down to earth. He's not extravagant. Um, he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't really value 
the nicer things in life, if that makes sense. Like, I see value in really expensive watches because I like them. Mm. He wears a watch that I bought him because he he wouldn't go and buy himself a really nice watch because he thinks, well, oh. yeah. he's just old school like that. Mm. You know, he's old school. He's He would think to himself, well, how much is that? I said, well, if I put that money there, I, it could make this much. Yeah. He, he sees, that we had a conversation recently because, you know, I am quite a flamboyant person, I'm quite extravagant, but I, I, I do things that earn money. I put my money in watches like you do that earn money. And because he hasn't really been accustomed to that, where he's very old school and thinks a watch is a depreciating asset and it's purely just to show off, it's not for him. Where he now has seen, like I remember when I bought my Richard Mille and I let him, he, he put it on, he, went, he was like, What's it called? So I says, it's Richard Meal. Uh, yeah. How much is that? I told him. He's like, how much <laughs> for that? What, why? I said, Dad, trust me. <sighs> You're off your head, you are. And then, then he'll see values and see what they're worth and mm. see how much profit's in it. And then he'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I quite like Richard Meal now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, so he's... um. He's, he's very old school in his ways. He's not, he's not a flamboyant person. You wouldn't think. And that's why we have a massive policy here, and we always have. We never judge a book by its cover. Mm. Someone can walk through them doors and not look like they're fit enough to wa wash the floor. But the difference is, on other days, you see both me and my dad washing the floor. You know, you cannot judge a book by its cover, and he's a perfect example of that. Mm. Who's your most famous client that you can name? Uh, we've had a lot of famous clients over the years. Um, it all depends what you like. If you like music, you can look at people like um, uh, Elton John, uh, Eric Clapton, um, uh, people like people like that. If you look at sports, you can look at um, David Beckham. You can look at um, Lennox Lewis. Uh, if you like um, acting. Um, no, actually, I don't think of anybody, any, any like well-known actors, like comedians, like Michael McIntyre and mm. and Jimmy Carr and, and people like that. You know, it's, it depends what you what you're into. Yeah. But someone might be into football and think, you know, oh, you know, I'm the famous, most famous person is David Beckham. You know, you know. Mm. But then, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of people. I remember back in the day where we used to sell these cars directly to these people. And now as time's got on, and I don't know if the world's changed or what's going on, but you tend to sell it to them via a team member or somebody right. who looks after that department in their life, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm. Which car is the worst for massive maintenance costs? Bugatti. Without doubt. Not even a question. How much? To, to run a Bugatti for a year, how much? 100,000. 100 grand? If you're lucky. How much is a service? 30. 30 grand for a service? Mm -hmm. Do you have to have them every year? Yep. And 100 grand if you're lucky? Yep. Because whilst it's year. being serviced, you know, there's something else that you get to do. Yeah, and then <laughs> tyres, 52,000 for tyres. What? 52 grand for four tyres? Yeah, euros that is, 50,000 euros for tyres. Yeah. Every third set of tyres, you need a set of wheels. <laughs> They're cheap. How much are the wheels? Uh, on the 75,000 euros. For a set Depending of on what wheels you have, some are more. <laughs> Is this why Bugattis have not really gone up like everyone exactly expected? Exactly why. But. Because you, we had dinner yeah, and you were like, Sorry. Yeah. yeah. But. <laughs> I nearly came back with a Bugatti. You can, you can box smart with a Bugatti. Tell yeah. us. You can. The world's opened up a bit. When I had my Bugatti, there was nowhere to send the car to for maintenance. It was you send it to Bugatti and that's it. They have you over a barrel. Forget what you want to pay them or what you can justify. Their charge is their charge because you can't go nowhere else. Well, you know what? Now you can. There's certain very, very well-respected service centers that can service a Bugatti at a fraction of a cost. And what is the biggest kick in the nuts is when you realize what it actually costs to do what Bugatti charge you for. Give us an example. Well, the example on when we done that, um, when I came and 
spoke at your event yeah, yeah. about the wing mirror. So tell me. They yeah. wanted £9,000 for a wing mirror motor. Not for the wing mirror, for Not, the, well, just no. the motor. So it wasn't the motor that was even probably, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a toggle, a switch on the side that adjust your wing mirrors, you know, so, in, out, up, down. So that they kind wanted of thing. nine grand for a wing mirror. It had a little bit of play in it, you know, in the, in the, in the switch. Yeah. I just, I was a bit OCD, so I wanted it tight, I wanted yeah. it perfect. So just sort that out. But yeah, we'll send you an email with a, with a quote. What do you mean a quote? So nine and a half thousand plus that to, um, to repair it. So I'm all about in life, like the phone call I had earlier, justification. If you can justify something to me, then I will buy it or I will sell it at the price that you've just justified it to me for, right? Right, humor me, Mr. Bugatti, justify it. Well, Carl, you need a new door card, you need a new motor, you need a new mirror. No, 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 I don't. No, I need like a washer that goes behind this toggle. That's all I need. Sorry, that's not on the parts list. It's nine and a half grand plus fat. So I thought, you know what? No way. Friend of mine, a, a customer of mine, who I've become quite decent friends with, makes parts for Formula One cars. So what he does know about uh, a car and intricate parts, he makes carbon fiber parts, what he knows isn't worth knowing. And he um, sent it to him, dropped it off, three days later, because he's got accounts with every manufacturer, three days later, went back, picked the car up. I was like, how much do I owe you? I'm thinking, you know, I know he's going to be cheap, a lot cheaper than Bugatti. It might be, a, it might be a couple of grand, maybe. You know, we'll, we'll have to see. So I'm going to show you. Right. Okay. Well, um, good news and bad news. The 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 good news is um, I could get you the part. The bad news is they they come in a pack of five, so I had to buy five of them. But the whole pack was eighty nine pence. <laughs> How much did he charge you? He didn't charge me. So he, just... he said, he said, Carl, your, your part was 89 pence that comes straight from a Volkswagen transporter. It's the same part. And it took me 20 minutes to, to do it. Like, it is what it is. They wanted nine and a half grand plus VAT. For a, 11,000 pounds. For an 89 pence part. Yeah. But that is them all over. And the, you know, the guys that I know at Bugatti, after they see this, they'll call me up and say, Carl, you're slagging us off. And I'm like, no. Not slagging you off. I'm just calling it as it is. Yeah. Those cars, uh, a, a Bugatti Veyron is actually a good buy at the minute because once people start realizing that they don't have to spend 100 grand a year to run them, they can spend 20 maximum to run them, they will go up in value. They should be five million pounds, a Why? Bugatti Veyron. Because they're a groundbreaking car. They change the world of automobiles, mm. completely change the world. But how much are they at the moment? I just sold one for 800. So they're under a million, you think they should be worth five? Yeah. Easily. But the price why is, is a, price. Why is a Ferrari F, why is a Ferrari Enzo worth three million pounds? They're not many of them. They're desirable. There's less, there's less Veyrons. Is it as fast as a Veyron? No. A Veyron cost nearly three times the price new. Oh, and has Bugatti not got a good brand name? It's Bugatti. So... You think the only reason they're really, what you think is underpriced is because of the maintenance it's cost? The, it's, it's fact. Yeah. It's absolute fact. And when people start realizing that, you know what, sending the car to Bugatti isn't my only option now, and getting ripped by Bugatti isn't my only option, these cars will go up in value. Right. You'll see it. Yeah. You should get on the train. I know you already <laughs> told me that. <laughs> you should get on the train. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Chuck in five of your cars. Keep two. <laughs> have the Veyron. Yeah. Done. All right, well, maybe I'll have a look round. Maybe I'll make it three out of three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you take, like, three or four of my cars? Yeah. You would? Yeah. I'll take that as well, if you <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tip for what you think will be the best supercar for value for 2024. Oh, there's a lot of great time to buy cars at the minute. Yeah, they've they've, they've hit a, they've hit a low, and great time to buy cars. Um, there's some great value for money cars out there. I've got a a McLaren MP412C. You know what that is? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sixty five grand. It's done eighteen thousand miles. It's sixty five grand. Right. It's a supercar. Yeah. 
new model Turbo S's, 120, 125,000. These cars two years ago were 225,000. Yeah. It's a great time to buy cars. 2024 is going to be full of value. Yeah. Have you got anything you can show me today? I've got loads of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <today. laughs> I've got loads of stuff. You know, the first thing my wife said, well, I already told you, but my wife said when I left the house, she said, don't buy another fucking car off car. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she did say if you get anything like the RSQ8, she'd be all right with that. She just doesn't want me to have another classic car or supercar sat in the garage. And you've still got the turbo? You still got the Testarossa? Still got the Testarossa, got the 911 Turbo, got the Aventador, got the Atom. Yeah, fun car. Yeah, I can't, I can't force myself to get rid of that because um, it's always pointless at the it, value. It there. is because what did I pay? Seventy grand for that, um, and enjoyment per pound. That is the best oh. value on the Look, planet. Sometimes, whatever car we get through the doors. I'm not interested in driving it really because I've driven it and I've done it. And yeah. I've, it is what it is. It's another car. I just sell the fucking thing. <laughs> um, but when I get an aerial atom in, I always <laughs> just take half an hour out my day that day and go for a blast somewhere and just laugh for half that, an hour and then come back. Yeah. I have never been in a car where at 50 miles an hour, you are having the most amazing experience ever. Is it just at me? At 50 miles an hour. I sometimes drive it at six o'clock in the morning yeah. when it's bright and it's cold and I drive at 50 and I physically laugh. Yeah, I know I do. Yeah. I physically laugh. Physically. But is it just me? <laughs> or does it make you a better driver, that car? Well, you have to be. Well, I just think you like... You have to be. I can find myself, and I'm not that good of a driver. I mean, I'm okay, but I'm not great. But I can find myself, I can make them cars do whatever I want them yeah. to do. If I want to drift it round a roundabout or a corner completely in control, yeah. you can. Yeah, because the thing with them as well is each time I stop at the lights... Like, you have to do it at number 11 off exactly, of every time. Yeah. You have to. And so you practice getting yeah. better at... <laughs> That's, yeah. Really good you do time. things in that car that you'd never do in a car. Yeah. Because you, you, you'd throw up so many warning lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, and just the sound because you've got that... Yeah, no radio. Right at your... In your I'll tell you rear. what's a very similar thing. But unfortunately, it's, it's a really anti-social car, is um, a BAC Mono. Right, never heard. Yeah, so yeah. it's a, it's a one-seater car, very oh, right. similar to an Atom, yeah. but more refined and a better car. Yeah. Um, the problem with them is it's one-seater. Well, the, one of the best experiences in an Atom is scaring the shit When you're with somebody, somebody else. else. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, they either scream with enjoyment or they're like, Stop yeah, this now. yeah, yeah. So an atom is a great. It's it's just you can't be in a bad mood and drive one of them. No. And like you say, I found myself like like howling <laughs> as <laughs> as I'm driving it, just absolutely crying of laughter because because yeah. I can't believe how it's just a motorbike with a steering wheel, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we've introduced a new round. Carl, okay. Since we came last, it's called the disruptors round. Okay. On the theme. I feel like this show. is like the bonus. No. <laughs> um, what's the most disruptive thing anyone's ever said or done to you? Um, oh, for me, that's quite a that's quite a deep question, isn't it? Um, no one could ever say anything disruptive to me now. But when I was younger, you definitely could and definitely did, and. Um, it probably would have been some kind of a comment on the likes of, you know, daddy's money. Uh, you know, you, you never, you're not responsible for anything. You know, it's all your dad and blah, blah, blah. No one can say that to me now um, because people have seen, especially with social media and people like watch your life as it progresses. But I would say that probably hurt um, mm. because being a young, being a kid, um, being brought up in a very strict household, having... To, you know, you were, we, weren't, we weren't given the opportunity to go to work. We were made to go to work. If you didn't go to school, you went to work. Um, my wife often jokes and says that, you know, I didn't have a childhood because I didn't have a PlayStation. Wasn't interested in a PlayStation. Um, never played a PlayStation. Um, it was just work, work, work. And you, you, you dedicate your life and your, and your childhood and you don't go off with your friends on a Wednesday and school holidays because you're at work, for then someone to turn around and say, oh, you're only f***ing daddy's cash anyway. Like, that, that hurts. But then you, you, you grow up and you think, I don't care what you think, you're an idiot. And those people that are not idiots, 
um, you know, seen how I have taken this business from where it was, which was at the top of its game, to the stratosphere. And in many ways, very experienced, clever businessmen have told me that that's harder to do. Well, I've worked for my dad and I've worked for myself and people don't give it enough kudos. They give kudos to being self-made and making your own money, which I have done, but I've worked with my dad and it is hard working with your dad and it's a different way that you have to build up and you still have to build up and you have to fight all that reputation of everyone just thinking you're getting an opportunity because you're the son. Yeah, and you know what, it is, it is some of it's true. You are getting an opportunity because we, we know, I'm his son, obviously. You know, we're not going to give the same opportunity to a stranger. But believe me, and you know me, Dad, a little bit now. If, 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 <laughs> if <laughs> you know, if I, couldn't, if I couldn't excel in an opportunity or it wasn't working out, he wouldn't be shy and tell me to crack on at something else, yeah. you know? Um, and that was, that was the apprenticeship from being, you know, 11 years old to being 18 years old. I was told, and I've said this to you before, when you're 18 years old, you need to be able, at the time there was me and my brother and my dad. So my brother and my dad were partners. Tom, Tom's a little bit older than me. And obviously I wasn't. And I was told you need to be able to buy a third of this business by the time you're 18. And if you can't, then this business is not for you. And whatever you've earned in between the time, you can take and go and do your own thing. At 18 years old, if you can buy whatever a third of the business and you don't want to, you can go and do your own thing. So you bought into this business? But I, I, everything I worked for from being 12 years old to 18, I worked every single day. Um, I bought a third into the business and pretty much had f all left after that. <laughs> after, that after that, so I had to buy a third of the stock, a third of the premises, yeah. a third of the business. You know. Wow. Yeah. What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? That was a big risk. Putting everything into this. Yeah. Business at yeah. Years old. I think. I think. Um, I think it's a risk when you put everything into. Um, your. Your own capabilities. You know. You got to back yourself in business, haven't you? To me, though, that's much less of a risk than because you into crypto because you because you know that's why. You, but that's why you excel. Right. Those who feel like they're taking a risk have not got the confidence in their ability. Right. Hence, it's a risk. Yeah. It was never a risk when you think, well, all I've got to do is do what I know I can. Yeah. Easy. I'll do that. Yeah. Because you know you can. Yeah. And what's your most brutal life lesson? Uh, most brutal life lesson is um... <laughs> there's a few brutal life lessons really but I always um... want the ones this happens a lot when yeah. I interview people I ask them they pause and then their face lights up or they laugh you want that one you're yeah about. that's yeah, the one yeah, I want yeah, yeah, come yeah. on yeah my my um, my uh, think before you speak <laughs> which you just said yeah. then. Think before you speak is... Um, if Give us you, an example of something you said that we should... Oh, it's not so much something you said, it's you could be, you could be out um, in, in the company of a lot older, cleverer men than you at that time in your life, and someone could pull up in a Rolls Royce, and they, and, um, they could say, um, do you want to buy that? And you go, yeah. All right, well, how much do you want to give me for it? You can't... Think about this. This ain't. You can't go back and speak to somebody. You're here and now. You need to put a, a bid out now, and that's how you learn. And some bids were good, and some bids weren't so good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, think. So what you're saying is sometimes you just spout out a number and you yeah. overpay. Or sometimes you could just say, "Bang, that's a nice card. Do you want to sell it?" But when you're 15 years old and you're not really 100 percent sure of the value of it, um, all of a sudden, that. now you've got. Go yeah, I do want to sell it. Yeah. There's no like, oh, okay, well, I'll come back to you tomorrow. And that's what, that's what is manifested in this business. When someone calls up that hotline and they want to bid for their car, they get it mm. there and then. And they can be paid there and then as well. There's no, let me speak to my director. Let me come back to head of business. Let me call you in three weeks. We're not buying at the minute. I'm not sure what's going on. None of that. Nah. There's none of that. Mm. So think before you speak. Or as my dad used to say when I was a kid, think before you sink. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, think before you sink. Yeah. This show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Um, I don't think disruptive means a bad thing. I think it's good to be a disruptor. Mm. Um, someone who doesn't, doesn't necessarily follow suit. Yeah. That, I think that's a disruptor. Mm. 
And where are you most active on socials? Where should we follow you? Uh, I'm most active on um, Instagram. I have a TikTok account that I don't manage myself. So you'll get whatever I post on Instagram, you kind of get your feed Instagram through. Is, what's the My name? Instagram is Carl Hartley One. Yeah. C A R L, Carl right. Hartley One. And then if someone wants to buy a car, I just want to say that I've bought two well, cars off yeah. you. It's been a great experience. Yeah, good, good. Two so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see our stock at tomhartley.com. Um, you can call us uh, 01283762762 or email us at info at tomhartley.com. Thanks for having me over again. Mate, well, it's always a pleasure. Cars. Always Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much. Huge news, years in the making. My brand new book that my publishers refuse to publish, Money Matrix. Beat the money system and build generational wealth. Understand the three main ways that the banks productize you and make money from you. You'll be able to turn that system against itself, build generational wealth and multiple streams of recurring income. It's all at moneymatrix.cash. And if you're quick, the first few hundred registrants and buyers will receive many special bonuses from me. The brand new Money Matrix a summit three-day special event meet me at a champagne reception meet me at a multi-millionaire networking dinner go now moneymatrix.cash this is huge Carl kindly said to me off camera that he thought I was the best interviewer that he's had because I can pick out the best bits of content so I would like to know from you what do you think were the best parts of this episode with Carl Hartley this is actually the third interview I've done with Carl. We have some good rapport and we've had millions of views. So make sure you go and check out the other two episodes on my show, Disruptors. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.